I, I, I'm very much a character when I go on stage. I believe in my part all the way down the line, right the way down. But it, I do play it for all it's worth because that's the way I do my stage thing. That's, that's part of what Bowie is supposedly all about. I'm, a, I'm a, an actor. David Bowie, one of the greatest pioneer artists and rock stars of the 20th century. A visionary, an innovator, a provocateur, extravagant and controversial. He transcended music, fashion, and art. A genuine songwriter whose songs reached unprecedented heights around the world. A man who kept expanding, exploring, and evolving throughout his life, inspiring and teaching generations of musicians about blending different styles of music. Changeable and unpredictable, he remains immortal in the hearts of many. Music is like a journey through your life, and his, his music punctuated my life in terms of question marks and exclamation marks and everything that's wonderful about music. I kind of followed it through. So today, yesterday is a tragic day for a lot of music lovers. And he's about light and music and love and everything that's wonderful in the world. Well, there's so much dark in the world that someone like Barry, so creative, you know, can just lift anybody. So that's why I find it so sad, really, that someone so special has gone. Listen to the chords he used. They are so unbelievably difficult. The song structures are just incredible. He didn't write three minute pop songs. He wrote pieces of art that we could listen to. David Bowie was a rock and roll revolution. Driven, fierce, and always wanting to escape conformity. An outsider, an adventurer, a man out of this world. David Bowie was born David Robert Jones on January 8, 1947, in Brixton, South London. He came from a working-class family. He had strong bonds with Terry, his half-brother, but he grew up in an unconventional household. A dark cloud roamed over his family. A number of his mother's relatives were touched by mental illness and suffered from schizophrenia. Some also committed suicide. Terry's mental health deteriorated later on, and Bowie was scared that he would also eventually be affected by this illness. In fact, some even said that the different personalities that David created throughout his life was a way of coping with his latent schizophrenic tendencies. He grew up a complicated man. When he was just 15 years old, a traumatic event happened to him. Bowie got in a fight over a girl and got punched in the eye. This led him to four months of hospital treatment, after which doctors came to the conclusion that young David wasn't going to see completely clearly again. He was left with a permanently dilated pupil. The incident gave Bowie those unique extraterrestrial eyes and his most iconic feature. At 17, David was already different and determined. He wore his hair long, really long, considering the times. After so many insults thrown his way about his hairstyle, he decided he just wasn't going to take it anymore. He formed a society called the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Long-Haired Men. This move was his first step on the path to fame that he would achieve within five years. Well, I think we're all fairly tolerant, but for the last two years we've had uh, comments like, darling, and uh, can I carry a handbag thrown at us? I think it's just had to stop now. No, I like it, and I think we all like long hair. And um, we don't see why should other people should persecute us because of this. England is a marvelous habit of being able to dissipate everything um, through this marvelous media and long hair quickly got dissipated. I mean, I, I, I used to be able to stop traffic quite easily by just walking down the street, you know, no more than that, just because I had long hair. A year later, at the age of 18, David Jones adopted the name David Bowie 
and from then on, he dreamed of reaching fame. Bowie was fascinated by space travel and inspired by the British rocker Vince Taylor, the legendary Stardust Cowboy, who after taking too many drugs and an emotional breakdown, decided he was an alien god on Earth. He created an androgynous and flamboyant persona called Ziggy Stardust. The name Ziggy came from a tailor shop he'd seen from a train window. Bowie took Ziggy Stardust as his stage persona. Ziggy was for him an alien rock star sent to Earth as a messenger. His intention was to create a character who looks like he's landed on Mars. With flame red hair and striking colorful costumes, he quickly developed his own style and looked extraordinary out of this world. His appearance actually reflected his feelings of being an outsider. He said that he often felt adrift and alienated from the normal world. But that seemed to appeal to audiences. It made him relatable because he had something for everyone and appealed to people who thought they were outsiders too. They were grateful to him for that. He made them feel like it was okay to be different. Whenever I photographed him live, he always had, you know, the 20 different costumes and so on. He was very different and he gave people the opportunity to, he, he made people understand that it was okay to be different. And a lot of kids, when they're growing up, they're not, you know, certainly in the 70s and late 60s, they weren't sure not only of their, their own sexuality, but of lots of things, and lots of kids are loners. And that just said, well, you know, I'm different, you can be different, and just get out there and be yourself. And I think it encouraged a lot of people to do that. And the fact that he was, it, you know, people say he was chameleon-like, but in a way, I, th I think, you know, he, he, was, he was an inventor as well, and a, an originator. And he never made the same album twice. I think when we were watching Ziggy Stardust, we felt we were part of um, a cult, really. Our parents were horrified that we would go and see a man who dressed like that. Bowie was always quite an underground artist anyway. He wasn't, you know, I mean, he was mainstream because the tabloids in the UK were kind of appalled by the way he looked. And so it was, you know, it was easy for them to put a splash on the front cover and criticise him. These are all the papers now who did 20 page pullouts about how great he was. But at the time, they weren't supportive at all. It became obvious to me that every young person at some point in their life thinks of themselves as the other, the outsider, the freak. And they had found in at least one of Bowie's many personae, the other, the outsider, the freak. They related to that. It gave them hope. Bowie had something for everyone, including black people. Uh, very important in the United States, where he did that uh, soul album, Young Americans, and the live soul tour, uh, and also in a famous confrontation on MTV in 1983, in which he criticized them for not playing enough black music. The widest range of people, for the widest variety of reasons, related to and felt grateful to this man, and I think that is the lasting legacy of Bowie, more so than any particular song or any particular album. Just five days before the first moon landing in 1969, Bowie released Space Oddity. It became his first top five entry on the UK single chart after its release. In 1972, he released the single Life on Mars, which reached number three in the UK. Is there life on Mars? There was magic and mystery in his music and lyrics. Following this success, 
His Ziggy Stardust tour catapulted him to stardom as he toured over the UK and the USA for a year and a half. This started a cult of Bowie and a long-lasting fandom. I'm a real trooper, you know. Uh, this is my life, really, you know, writing or performing. I don't there's not much else I want. It was at that point uh, with Ziggy that his uh, previous releases started flooding into the charts. And in late 72 and uh, 73, Britain had Bowieitis, where every, everything he'd done was in the chart at the same time. And uh, it was a very giddy period uh, for uh, people who had not known his work because it was suddenly like, this is the most productive man of the year. And uh, in early 73, Space Oddity was finally a hit single in the United States. Of course, Space Oddity was helped in Britain by the fact that the BBC played it in coverage of moon operations. Just when Starman uh, was a, a success, just when the Ziggy Stardust album was a huge success, I saw him playing in the Glasgow Pole, a huge venue, and it was so popular to do two shows, and, and I was working that night, I was playing that night. So I went along to see this afternoon show, and it was just astounding. I had four people on stage making this amazing noise, and the presence that the man had was just, it was uncanny. He, he, could, he had the entire audience in the palm of his hands. And, and I, I seem to remember, in my memory of it, because it, it gets kind of coloured over the years, my memory was an incredibly exciting, vibrant show. In reality, it was just four guys on stage playing music and a few flashing coloured lights. But it was something I'd never experienced before. It changed my opinion on music forever. Bowie became famous not only for his music, but also for his appearance. Something that the whole world talked about. He looked strange, but he was made to be in history. Bowie married Angie Barnett in 1970, his first wife. She was the one who actually encouraged him to feel confident in dressing more feminine. They had a son they named Zoe Bowie, now known as Duncan Jones, who was born in 1971, but was more of a marriage of convenience, a show business marriage. Their love was doomed from the beginning. He ended up getting tired of her wanting to direct his career. Their golden years turned to ashes, and they divorced in 1980. Bowie declared himself gay in an interview in 1972 coinciding with his campaign for stardom as Ziggy, which was deemed very courageous. On other occasions, he declared himself bisexual in 1976, and in 1993, a closet hetero. He did say that these were more a product of the times than his own feelings. He knew that this would allow him to get more attention from the media and draw more audiences to his music. His goal was super stardom, to reach worldwide success, and to be moving the culture. He refused to be put in a category so that he could have room to work in and could remain creative. No label could describe him. Some declare that he was more transgressional than he was ever really gay, heterosexual, or bisexual. He probably liked experimenting out of curiosity the same way he experimented with everything else in his life. Bowie was never politically engaged or an activist, but by being a queer icon, he did a lot for the sexual revolution of the 1970s. His influence was even above the activists. You often heard the word visionary used about Bowie, and uh, he was, throughout the 1970s into the early 80s, ahead of everybody's curve. It's very interesting uh, to read a couple of comments by uh, people from today's LGBT community trying to figure out how Bowie relates to today's community uh, by the standards of the, today's community. And uh, because everybody notices, well, he didn't actually do any political activism. And that's because he was above political activism and what he was doing had a greater effect than political activism because he didn't 
uh, affect laws, he affected human beings. And he probably did as much for gay liberation as any individual law during the time period because he liberated the people in themselves. It was weird. I mean, I have to say, you know, as a, a working class kid growing up in Glasgow, you know, quite a hard city at the time, uh, you know, to see this androgyny on national television was shocking and unbelievably exciting because the music was great. The look of the guy was fantastic. Him and Mick Ronson, the, he's a guitarist sidekick, were just outstandingly powerful, but brilliant mu music. So it, it kind of took that whole, I don't know, would you just call it glam rock? I'm not sure you'd call it glam rock. It took that whole idea of Top of the Pops being a bit fun and bubbly and whatever, and challenged it. It just, it held a mirror up to us all saying, okay, you know, you think your life is okay. This is what we can do. This is acceptable. This is okay to have this bizarre, you know, presence uh, on your screen. Yeah, and and it, it uh, you saw it. You saw people react in, in very strange and wonderful ways. But it was like a it was like a door opening in, in the youth of that that period. It was a door opening in their their world uh, that that exposed them to something that they had never ever thought about. You know, this this fantastic weird almost alien-like character coming into your sitting room. It was just incredibly exciting. In 1972, he released the lead single to his album, Aladdin Sane, that would remain one of his signature tunes, The Gene Genie. It became Bowie's biggest hit to date. The Gene Genie lives on his back. In July 1973, Bowie and his backing glam rock group, The Spiders from Mars, performed at the Hammersmith Odeon in London. The sold-out concert was triumphant, but Bowie made the sudden surprise announcement that the show would be the last show he would ever do. Later understood to mean that he was retiring his Ziggy Stardust persona. It was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen on stage to that date. Seeing Bowie marry that theatricality, in a way, with rock music was something nobody had ever done. People were talking about it for weeks beforehand and really, really looking forward to it. And then on the night, so many kids were dressed up, so many people wanted to look like Bowie, and we'd all had our hair pennered and, you know, various degrees of success. Your memory of it at the time, you didn't have that to compare it to. You had nothing to compare it to. And it was, it, it was until then the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. I would still say it was one of the greatest shows I'd ever seen. Now Ziggy play guitar, jamming good with weird and get it. And the spiders from Mars, with a bladed left hand. It was some kind of discovery in the 80s, I think, uh, that uh, a lot of what I am is, is my, the, uh, my, my enthusiasms, that I've always been uh, a very curious and enthusiastic person, again, as says, from when I was a teenager, and that it really wasn't up to me to try and identify exactly what that meant. I just had to accept that I was a person that had a very short attention span, would move from one thing to another quite rapidly. Throughout his career, he appeared in over 30 movies, television shows, and theatre productions. His love for acting manifested in the way he immersed himself completely in the characters. He often stated that he preferred dressing up as Ziggy rather than being David. His musical and film roles added another dimension to his career. Whatever persona he was playing, the work was always creative and imaginative. His theatricality and creativity fascinated people. His shows like Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Sane were filled with shocking stage moments where he looked almost as if he was being possessed. As soon as he walked on the stage, he unleashed this crazy character. But off stage, he was intensely private. I think, well, that's great. You know, there must be moments where the persona takes over, the character kind of dominates, because that's all we ever get to see. 
but then you see the guy behind it and it's, it's, it, the character's a mannequin, it's a, it's a vehicle for him to express himself. But every time I ever met him, he was this funny, lovely, you know, warm, you know, just great character. I, I, I'm very much a character when I go on stage. I feel, yeah, I believe in my part all the way down the line, right the way down. But it, I do play it for all it's worth because that's the way I do my stage thing. That's, that's part of what Bowie is supposedly all about. I'm, a, I'm a, an actor. I think he was intensely private off stage and, you know, he can dress up and be this outrageous figure on video in film on stage. But off stage, in a way, he, he was never that much of a public figure. With his fame came difficulties and challenges. Some of his singles and albums didn't have the success that he was expecting, and he was often disappointed and angered by the crowd's response. At 27, 1974, he was also broke and in serious financial trouble due to lack of business management. Oh, I need the money. <laughs> I desperately need the money. I've been a silly boy about my financial arrangements. And it's only over the last couple of years that I've been able to get back anything uh, from almost 10 years working publicly. So I, I really, I really have to do this. I mean, it's, it's my job. And it's sort of, it's like carting your paintings around the exhibitions and the galleries trying to sell a few. And for me, it's the equivalent thing. He also started to struggle separating Ziggy Stardust from his own character off stage, and his personality became affected. Bowie was always striving for innovation, novelty, and experimentation. And it turned out that playing the same character over and over was exhausting. His enthusiasm started to fade. In 1975, at 28, he relocated to Los Angeles, leaving his Ziggy alter ego behind. Bowie released his 10th album, Station to Station, in 1976 with a new character. After Ziggy Stardust came, the elegant, thin white Duke. Again, the persona was based on a humanoid alien played by Bowie in the film The Man Who Fell to Earth. The album made the top five in both the UK and US charts, and this put him back on solid financial ground. Again, it was so different, and, and the influence of soul on his music and the kind of music he'd been listening to in the US made a completely different album. But I loved that persona as well, the Thin White Duke uh, period. I don't know if it was, if again, it's because I saw him then and I was so young and it kind of formed an impression, but it was so mysterious and, you know, he really, he, but it, it was very exotic for me, very, as a young child, it was very exciting. However, the 70s were one of the worst periods of his life. He became addicted to cocaine, which caused severe weight loss and paranoia, and it affected his sanity deeply. He overdosed several times during the year of 1976. He even claimed that he was pro-fascism, and compared Hitler to rock stars such as Mick Jagger, which he later on apologized for and blamed on his psychosis from cocaine use. It was a time of huge emotional and inspirational struggle for him. He claimed that his drug addiction and delusional behavior were due to Los Angeles, which he came to resent as he felt the city alienated him and that he was living like one of his characters. He was falling apart but he realized it and decided to make a change. And as I really didn't want to be one myself, I was living more and more in the style of one of my 
characters who wanted terrific success because they're all, they're all messiah figures, most of them, either um, light or dark shadowings. Um, and so because I knew, I, I really felt that, that the material aspect was something that had to be done in Los Angeles because it's, it's driven into you. It's, all, it's the, the food of Los Angeles, Hollywood rather, not Los Angeles, unfair on Los Angeles. Um, uh, and so I, I just packed up everything one day and I moved to, back to Europe again. He and his family left California for Europe in late 1976 to improve his physical and mental well-being. He moved to Switzerland for a time, where his cocaine use decreased. There, he indulged in his childhood passion of painting, which was a way for him to make sure he was always doing something productive and creative. He was also an art collector. That's the first thing I did when I got back to Europe, was to sort of stop thinking about music and performing for a bit and think about something that I hadn't done for a long time, which was paint. Um, and that helped me get back into music again, actually. Whatever the job in hand is, is the style that I tend to adopt. I'm pretty anti-consistency in style, much as I am in music. Would you give up music for art? No, but neither would I give up art for music. I am really fortunate in, in having both the time and the inclination and, and uh, possibly the talent to uh, work with in both mediums. I'm not a buyer of things. I think the only thing that I buy uh, addictively and obsessively, probably, is uh, uh, art. You know? I'm not really a house man or a car man. The only nice car I've ever bought for myself was uh, 1967 E-Type, one and a half, which is quite, I would get the half. I, I don't have things, I don't have a, a plane, I don't have a, a I haven't, oh, I haven't got very much, Jared. I'm not a buyer of stuff. I much rather, I do tend to regard money as the oil to get other things going. I much, uh, I feel more comfortable with it right now. But he wasn't completely over his drug use. He settled in West Berlin in early 1977, joining his friend Iggy Pop to clean up and revive his career. He felt revitalized even though he struggled sometimes to stay clean and sober. While he was sharing an apartment with Iggy, he started to gain more interest in the German music scene and began focusing on minimalistic ambient music. In October 1977, he released his 12th studio album, Heroes. It became the best received work of his Berlin trilogy and a commercial success. But Bowie not only knocked it out of the park with heroes, he made heroes seem like an anthem for the day. We can be heroes just for one day. The fact that people still want to hear heroes, even though it was novel at the time, shows it's a quality piece, regardless of the fact that it was innovative. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, the Low album still sounds great. He's described his time here as the happiest period of his life. The city seemed to correspond with his personality, from his interest in history, from the Weimar Republic, to the Berlin he discovered here in the 1970s. His passion for discovery and innovation, his interest in art, which whilst in Berlin led him to take up painting again. It was here that he seemed to escape his demons, to throw off creative burnout and rejuvenate his inspiration. By 1978, he'd broken his drug addiction and was slowly recovering to a healthy enough mental state. iSolar 2 World Tour was the first tour where he didn't have to take copious quantities of cocaine before taking the stage. By the time he had reached 30, his marriage with Angie had deteriorated. They reached a breaking point in 1980 
and Bowie gained sole custody of their son. This was a bold move, and he was determined to be a good role model for him. In 1980, he moved to New York and made his debuts in Broadway with Elephant Man, where he played a man with a grotesque, disfiguring disease. He identified with the role, as he always had an attraction to alienated people, feeling like one himself. His work was critically acclaimed. Dependable. Because Romeo does not care about Juliet. Not care. Does he take her pulse? Does he get a doctor? Does he make sure? No. He kills himself. The illusion fools him. Because he does not care about her. He only cares about himself. Uh, I always look for uh, characters who have either an emotional or a physical limp. Um, I find that, uh, for me, not being a... Um, I don't really see my future in, in acting to a greater extent than my involvement now. So I, I, I really like to have characters that I can at least play around with. In 1981, Bowie moved to the new romantic and pop era. He paired with Queen for a one-off single release, Under Pressure. The duet was a hit. He reached his prime at 36 with Let's Dance, and other hits such as Modern Love and China Girl. Let's Dance reached number one in the UK, the US, and various other countries in 1983. It sold more than 10 million copies worldwide, making it Bowie's best-selling album of all times. Put on your red shoes and dance the blues. Starting out now, I yeah. think, did I read somewhere that you said if you were 19, you wouldn't go into it? I think that's probably quite right. I think, I think I'd probably just be a, um, a fan and a collector of records. Uh, what would you do? I, I, I wanted to be a musician because it seemed, um, it seemed rebellious, it seemed subversive. It felt like uh, one could affect change um, to a form. It, um, it was very hard to hear music when I was young, you know. Um, when, I, when I was really young, you had to tune into AFN radio to hear the American records. Uh, there, there was no MTV, and there was no, it wasn't sort of wall-to-wall -wall blanket music. And so therefore it had a kind of a, a, a call to arms kind of feeling to it. That this is the thing that will change things. This is uh, a dead dodgy occupation to have. It still oh, produced signs of horror from people who said, yeah, I'm, a, I'm in rock and roll, it's, my goodness. Now it's a career opportunity. His fan base exploded as he entered popular culture. By becoming less underground and controversial, he reached a wider audience and appeared more accessible and mainstream, topping charts along with Tina Turner and Michael Jackson. I think his breakthrough kind of crossover album was obviously Let's Dance. And that's when I felt he'd gone a bit too commercial for me. Because we like, you know, you kind of like your artists to be unknown and be underground and to, you, to be part of that secret society almost. I embrace the idea that there's a new demystification process going on between the artist and the audience. Um, I think when you look back at, say, this last decade, there hasn't really been one single entity, artist, or group that have personified or become the brand name for the 90s. It, like, it was starting to fade a little in the 80s. and In the 70s, there were still definite artists. In the 60s, there were the Beatles and the Hendrix. And in the 50s, there was Presley. Now it's uh, subgroups and genres. It's hip hop, it's girl power. It's a, a diff it's a communal kind of thing. It's about the community. It's becoming more and more about the audience. Because the point of having somebody who led the forces 
has disappeared because the vocabulary of rock is too well known. It's a currency that is not, um, it's not devoid of meaning anymore, but it's certainly only a conveyor of information now. It's not a conveyor of rebellion. And the internet has taken on that, as I say. Um, and, uh, and so I find that a terribly exciting area. So from my standpoint, being a, a, an artist, I like to see what the new construction is between artist and, and audience. There is a breakdown. There's a, uh, personified, I think, by the, uh, the rave culture of the last few years, where the audience is at least as important as whoever is playing at the rave. Um, it's almost like the artist is to accompany the, the audience and what the audience is doing. And that feeling is very much permeating music. However, he eventually came to realize that being mainstream was not what he was really after. He was more used to being stubborn, obscure, and confrontational. It's quite a relief, really. I feel a lot more um, uh, free in, in what I do. I, it just needed, it just needed a, a positive decision to only do what I want to do and not do things for the sake of what you know, either David Bowie or whoever I was playing last time, Thin White Duke or something, was expected to do. Bowie always loved pushing limits challenging himself. He, in fact, believed that a good artist has to go out of their depth to become meaningful, and that it requires some kind of social dysfunctional nature. Incredibly uh, interested artist. He was interested in various kinds of music, and of course, uh, the various arts. And uh, he picked up elements from the avant-garde in all sorts of areas and incorporated them into his own work. I got to a st stage two years ago where I, f I found that the experimenting that I was doing was uh, eradicating a lot of the subject matter of my writing. But now I feel for the next few years I'll be concentrating uh, on a lot more basic, earthier kind of material. In January 1985, during Bowie's prime, he received a devastating news that would break his heart. His brother, Terry, had committed suicide. It was a difficult and tragic period for him. He would later on write a song about the death of his brother called Jump, but he had to put his struggle aside. In 1988, he formed a new act, Tin Machine, a hard rock supergroup. He once more reinvented rock and roll. However, it was hard to top his previous hits. Tin Machine didn't have as much success as he had expected, as he was once again experimenting by doing different things to challenge himself. He fell out of favor for many people. You belong in rock and roll. You belong in rock and roll. Well, so do I. I love how she the 1990s seemed to be the legend's forgotten decade, where his work was overlooked. But he didn't dwell on the negatives, and he was determined to move on to the next adventure. He had a lapse in the 90s, <laughs> you know, his, uh, his bad period for a few years. But he, I think, in my opinion, he, he came back, he came through that. You know, and I think in his own admission, he would say that he was after taking the money, you know, and, um, and his creativity suffered massively. You know. In my tour of television studios the day Bowie died, not a single person asked me about Bowie in the 1990s. It's as if his work in that decade had existed only for his fans. And even though one of his albums did reach number one in Britain during that decade, but the curious thing is that Bowie in the 90s was still an extraordinarily influential person. In 1992, he married his second wife in Switzerland, the Somali-American fashion model Iman, with whom he had one daughter named Alexandria. In 1996, his musical success was finally recognized, and he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This was a groundbreaking accomplishment for him. Mr. David Bowie. Well, that's right. 
Where me and my buddies are hanging out at the Hollywood Entertainment Museum, I can just whip out a mirror, hold it up and say, that's my star up there, with my name written backwards, Divad Ewob. Thank you very much. If I make any more bad albums, you can come over here and walk all over me, all right? He finally had reached a stable, successful life, which gave him more time to focus on both his passions, music and painting. I'm doing a, a music also for a game. I'm doing a lot of stuff on the internet. Um, I'm doing a lot of painting and uh, a little bit of sculpting. Uh, I'm uh, enjoying married life tremendously. It was my seventh wedding anniversary the other day. I'm a sick, sick of June. The hub of my creativity comes from what I do and where I go. I, I put myself in places one that maybe I've never been before, um, or that I, f I feel there's a certain tension involved. I can't, I can't really write or produce much if I'm in a place that's, that's relaxing. I have to have a set of conflicts going around me, not necessarily of my own doing. I've learned that that is a particularly bad idea. What do you mean? So, well, I, I don't create my own conflicts in my own life. I think I might have done that to quite an extent when I was younger. Is, is actually things were going too smoothly. I would be drawn, because be, being an addictive personality, I would be drawn to create conflicts that would produce the tension necessary to write. Now I find uh, that I can do it by observation more than being perhaps hmm. deeply involved in a mess <laughs> to be able to write. I mean, at a personal level, you don't do drugs anymore. No, absolutely not. And you don't drink? I don't drink either, no. Not even a glass of wine or anything? No, it would kill me. If I what started do you mean it would kill you? I'm an alcoholic, so it, was, uh, it would be a uh, kiss of death for me to start drinking again. Uh, my relationships with my friends, my family, everybody around me are so good and have been for so many years now, I wouldn't do anything to destroy that again. You know, it's very hard to have relationships when you're doing drugs and, uh, and drinking. I, f for me personally, anyway, um, and uh, you become closed off, unreceptive, insensitive, all the dreadful things that you've heard every other pop singer ever say. And uh, I was very lucky that I found my way out of that. In 1999, the front cover of Hours showed an older Bowie with shoulder-length hair. From then on, he never released anything as frenetic as he did in the 1990s. A lot of what I am is my enthusiasms, that I've always been a very curious and enthusiastic person, again, as says, from when I was a teenager, and that it really wasn't up to me to try and identify exactly what that meant. I just had to accept that I was a person that had a very short attention span, would move from one thing to another quite rapidly uh, when I got bored with the other. I became comfortable with that and didn't try and identify myself or try and ask myself who I was. The less questioning I did about myself uh, as to who I was, the more comfortable I felt. But so now I have absolutely no knowledge of who I am, but I'm extremely happy. In 2003, Bowie performed his reality tour, which would become his last tour. The show was cut short after a blocked artery forced him to have emergency heart surgery. He retired from live performing three years later and stepped out of the public eye to focus on his family. But he never stopped being part of the music scene and continued to produce albums. On January 10, 2016, the world was shaken by heartbreaking news. David Bowie died from liver cancer. He apparently had been quietly battling with it for 18 months. 
He had told very few people about it, focusing rather on creating a new album, Black Star, which would reveal itself being a farewell album. Black Star reflected the theme of death and mortality and mysticism of the afterlife, and he wanted his last album to outlive him. Days before his death, people didn't guess that he was ill. He put on a brave face until the end, and even the press wrote that he looked very well and healthy. But behind the podium from his Lazarus musical premiere, he collapsed from exhaustion. Having kept his illness a secret from the world, he died two days after his 69th birthday and the release of his 25th and final album, Black Star which took on a whole new, unexpected depth. By the time I got to New York I was living like a king Then I used up all my money Obviously, the, the, the Black Star album, everybody's, you know, now, since he died, has seen the meaning in the lyrics of you know and it's and it's really obvious now but obviously without him dying it would, wouldn't have been that obvious at all he was just always out there ahead extraordinary and and then the ultimate artistically planning for his own death when they were making the album black star which actually was in the first half of uh, 2015 at one point, Tony Visconti, his producer, looked to him and said, you're writing a farewell album. And Bowie laughed. It, it, Tony Visconti was the first to realize this is goodbye. To make even your final weekend a work of art, this is just off the scale of performance art. It takes your breath away such courage and the scene where he walks backwards into the wardrobe and closes the door All his life, he dealt with personal and professional struggles, and his career wasn't always filled with successes, but he always overcame what life threw at him. People were actually ringing in a state of shock, you know, and incredibly upset. So many people were, were so touched by it and so shocked by it because I think Bowie, because he was quite otherworldly, you never really thought he had the same mortality. And it was a shock, it was a terrible shock. You can never imagine such a loss until it happens because he was a life force. And the reason why so many people are touched by this news is because he touched their personal lives. In the 1970s, with all of those various images that he went through, he was always doing some variation of the other, the outsider. And every young person thinks of themselves as the other, the outsider, the freak. And they latched on to one or more of those Bowie images. And thus, his loss is very personal to so many people watching at this moment. Bowie channeled his family's mental illness by expressing himself through different personas. He overcame drug addiction and found peace and stability. He never stopped reaching for the stars and influenced generations. Family, frustration, and failure would shape the icon we know today. He's one of a kind. This is uh, one reason why the grief is so widespread and so deep is because people know that this is it. That was it just to think that uh, the Earth is billions of years old and you happen to live at the same time as David Bowie. Well, we did see someone unique, that's for sure. He did everything and he never stopped. He never stopped challenging himself or his audience. And I think that's incredibly special. I mean, when you look at today's artists, no one's pushing it like that. It just doesn't touch people in the same way. It's magic, his music is magic, it takes you places. It's otherworldly, it's, it's sort of spiritual in a sense. 
but it's about romance and love and, and everything that's good in the world, you know, about being different and being accepted. He teaches us that change is possible, that we're not fixed as human beings, that we can be anything that we want to be. And he also really spoke to people that are unique, that don't quite fit in, because he was kind of this alien angel <laughs> child that came down to set us all free. When he was at his peak, uh, it, it was completely awe-inspiring and you'd go to see the shows and they'd be utterly different. Not all of them successful, but hey, it didn't matter because come back in six months and there'd be a new one. And that's literally the way it was. And this is how Bowie could have the occasional miss and no one held it against him because they knew he was trying something different and he'd be back in six months with something else. When I was a teenager, I had it in, in my mind that I would be a creator of musicals. I, I, I sincerely wanted to write musicals um, for the West End, or for Broadway, whatever. I didn't see much further than that. Um, as a writer, and I really had the idea in my head that people would do my songs. Um, and I was not a natural performer. I didn't feel at ease on stage, ever. I had created this one character, Ziggy Stardust, that it seemed that I would be the one that would play him because nobody else was doing my songs and the chances of my actually getting a musical mounted were very slim. And so I became Ziggy Stardust for that period. Whatever. And things sort of led. I liked, I liked the idea and I, I felt really comfortable going on stage as somebody mm -hmm. else. And it seemed a, a, a rational decision to keep on doing that. And so I got quite besotted with the idea of just creating character after character. Um, and I think probably there must have been a point in the late 70s, well, I know there was, where I felt that the characters were in fact getting in the way of myself as a writer and I endeavoured to kind of kill them off and, and start writing for me uh, as, as just a, a singer-songwriter. I'm not sure if I was ever successful in that because I, I, I do take a degree of theatricality when I go on stage all the time. I, it's, you know, sort of, that's how I deal with the stage situation. I'm still not comfortable on stage. But I mean, David Bowie himself is an invention. I mean, do you think of yourself as Bowie or David Jones, the boy from South London? Uh, less and less as, as Bowie, Bowie, Bowie. Uh, there's an astonishing body of work there and there's an, a, an amazing collection of music that is so original all the time and that sometimes draws on what's around at the time and other times kind of sets, you know, sets the agenda for other musicians. I don't think there's a single rock musician today who hasn't been influenced by Bowie in some way or other. He was a, a, a giant of the music industry, you know, not just someone who had been successful over a long period, which is a very difficult thing to do, but someone who consistently pushed the boundaries, who consistently uh, challenged what people would expect to hear. He earned our respect as he chose to stay true to himself rather than commercially safe. The odds against another David Bowie are astronomical because of the commercial pressures of the music industry force most artists to conform. Occasionally there's someone who stays true to themselves, like Adele, and the public latch on to that and love it. But very few, even of those kinds of artists, have the variety of interests and talents that Bowie did. Even now, to watch him in his film roles, whether they're great films or not, he is charismatic. Uh, he is a presence to contend with and I think of so many people watching right now who will in their minds have an image of David Bowie but it won't be the same image because he did so many different things. Such a variety of styles and images can only come from an inquiring mind and that's what Bowie had, an intensely interested mind. He was always picking up elements of the avant-garde and bringing them into the mainstream. Uh, and thus, in the 1970s alone, we had this amazing progression, science fiction, to bisexuality, to American soul music, to electronic music, and the images, Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, the Thin White Duke, the soul look, the Berlin electronic music look. There was so much to digest. In the 1970s alone, 24 hit singles, 15 albums. This is amazing, and that's why people have been digesting his work ever since. There's just so much there. My phone started ringing at seven o'clock the morning that David Bowie's death was announced. I have not had so many requests for broadcast commentaries since John Lennon Day 36 years ago.
That's phenomenal. That tells you the widespread impact of Bowie amongst the current generation. It's just that hundreds of millions of people all had personal relationships with David Bowie. And this is what became so movingly apparent so quickly. This showed you that somehow, some aspect of his life had affected the widest possible range of world personalities and, of course, people who were not famous. I found this deeply moving. Genius is an overused word, but I think musically, creatively, artistically, David Bowie was a genius. Um, for someone of my age, he provided a lot of the soundtrack of our lives. So we mourn the loss of a great talent. Uh, we think about uh, his family and friends who've, who've lost a loved one uh, too early. But I think also we celebrate an immense British talent who has enriched all of our lives. I grew up listening to David Bowie. Uh, my mom really, really loved him. And I suppose he was my first introduction to sort of queerness and outsiderness and just such a strong, joyful presence. Having him as an influence from when I was very young, influence everything I've done really, um, from how I dress to artwork to everything and just to being confident in who I am. He's done more for me than anyone could know. I suppose he just liberated so many people from, I don't know, mundane things. He came from suburbia, you know, just a lot of people could relate to that and, and how he just made life just sexy and, and vibrant and throughout his career. It's going to be a very different world without Bowie in it. I hadn't really given it a lot of thought about his passing because why would I, you know, it's like, really thought he would live forever, really. Few artists marked the 20th century like David Bowie did. He was an astonishing, passionate, and eclectic performer that didn't belong in a box. Searching for change was the only constant that didn't change throughout his life. He was a true artist in every sense of the word. His art included not only his music and sound, but also his style and appearance, his films and videos. Bowie had a unique vision and courage and seemed to turn everything into art. The Human League founder, Martin Ware, declared that he lived his life as though he were an art installation. His influence is deep. His generosity, his energy, his spirit, so full, so real, that's the essence of being alive. Because let's face it, how many people can die and have 28 albums sell in large quantities? What he did is absolutely timeless. We'll be listening to it in 100 years' time, you know. Any musicians out there, listen to the chords he used. They are so unbelievably difficult. The song structures are just incredible. He didn't write three minute pop songs, he wrote pieces of art that we could listen to. If you were there in the 60s and 70s, you were there. If you weren't, you missed it. You can still love the music, don't worry. But to have been there as well is to have lived through a very special moment in musical history. And uh, David Bowie is one of the giants of the period. Thank mm -hmm. you.